What's up, everybody? It's Saliana, and we are back in the man cave. It is Hometown Sessions, coming to you live somewhere in New England from my dingy little house that has no one in it ever because of COVID. Fuck you. Thank you very much. Um, Tonight, I uh, have a very, very special guest with me, and I want to get right into it because we have a lot of stuff to talk about because we've known each other for a very long time. So if you're a guitar player of any kind and you haven't heard of this guy, then you may think about changing instruments. And if you have heard of this guy, then you definitely probably want to change instruments and take your guitar and fucking throw it right through the wood chipper. So let me show you what I mean. Give me 60 seconds of the guy that's coming up. Sessions, Mr. Nuno Betancourt. What's up, buddy? Where's the applause? Where's that was the it. I built it in. It was the audience. I'll do it myself. It was, I'll do it myself. It was the budget. live, the live applause. Dude, I gotta tell you, so for anybody watching right now, Nuno, I mean, this guy has played with everyone from Janet Jackson to Rihanna to Perry Farrell, and the list just goes on and on and on. Um, but I'm really happy yes, I'm to have you one. here because ultimately you're just my friend, man. So thanks for coming That's on board. Right, I appreciate right. it. Thanks for inviting me to the man cave, man. I, I feel privileged. How you um how you doing out in, in sunny California where the weather's always man, beautiful? No, <laughs> yeah, man. It's well, it was a little bit cold last week. It dropped down to like sixty-eight or sixty-nine or something like that. So we we, we had to put oh, out cold to turn on the heat. Yeah, sixty-nine, poor guy. <laughs> <laughs> it's terrible. Uh, it, look, you know, we've been I've been lucky, you know, blessed. Unfortunately, you know, we don't need to get into it, but knowing the state of affairs, you know, unfortunately there's a lot of, a lot of people out there struggling and, and, and suffering and people are sick, but you know what? I've, I've been blessed being here at my studios here at home. So I just been working, man. I've been writing and creating and getting through all this while being able to be a musician, be an artist, be, yes. a, you know, be a writer. So this has been, I've been lucky, man. I've been Perfect. Lucky. Yeah, I've been doing the same thing. I'm just trying to keep myself busy. That's why I have fucking NBC studios in my house right now because I'm bored. That's why I'm doing this. I'm bored yeah. and I'm helping people stay entertained, I hope. Um, That's good, man. Good. Yeah. yeah, but I, so, so for those of you who don't know, Nuno is no stranger to the New England weather either because you spent many, oh many years here, right? When did you actually Listen. come here? You came in from Portugal? Is that right? Yeah, I came off the boat. I stepped off the boat back in 71. Uh, in, uh, Back in 71. <laughs> Seriously. And, Isn't that like uh, prohibition days? Speaking of prohibition. Yeah, yeah. Back in the 1900s, for sure. Back mm. in the 1900s. And, uh, and I, you know, never left. And listen, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm a mass, mass boy. It's, it's really my home in here. You know, it's not a home is a home is a, a, fr- a frame of mind, not a, not a, a geography. And that's, that's Massachusetts, man. I want to remind you about a couple of things. So me and Nuno met back 
right around, it was like the summer of 90. And I remember this because I was living in North Carolina before that, doing some stuff when my mother dragged me out of the New England area for getting into way too much trouble. Um, <clears throat> and then I came back summer of 90, which is when I met Paul. And, yeah. um, and I started to get turned on to, to you guys because you were just about ready to release the porno graffiti record. Wow. And yep, and so me and Paul had become friends. Your, uh, Paul Geary was the drummer at the time who is now Godsmack's manager and has been our manager since the beginning. Um, but it was crazy because I was, I was young and I was super desperate to like do something in music. I hadn't gotten a deal yet. I was like just a young, desperate, you know, musician kid sleeping on my sister's couch and bumming five bucks for a pack of cigarettes and... Yeah eating oodles and noodles and convincing very large women to take me in so that maybe they would feed me a steak and playing nice. gigs for like 50 bucks and a case of beer. Um, hey, and then I met you guys well. and I got to tell you, dude, like seriously, I, and I know we've been friends for a while now, whatever, but I really was starstruck by you guys because you were in it, man. You were like, you had released your second record or you were just about to, and just to go to your shows. And, and it was, it was really larger than life for me at the time. And it became a real big inspiration. And I know there's, there's one thing that I, I don't even know if you have known over the years, which is the, the drum battle that me and Shannon are known for doing was all spawned. It all kind of was birthed through being inspired by what you guys used to do back yeah. at that time when you played you percussion. Oh, yeah. Exactly. I'll yeah, I think. I'll take, I'll, take, I'll take you one further. When you gave me, you gave me later on when I was doing a solo album, you gave me an opening spot and on one of your shows up in, I think it was up in New Hampshire or Maine. I couldn't remember. But oh, yeah, Bush played with us too, I think, right? Was it yeah, Bush? And I, remember, I remember, and I remember going up and watching you do the, the jam on the side and I was like, wow, man. That's cool. It might and then I was like, wait a fuck, wait a second. Those are my fucking old congas as well. Painted <laughs> <laughs> them black. Fucking Gary. Fucking all that shit. <laughs> yeah, but that like, really, I don't cool. know if a lot of people know that, but people are always like, well, how did this thing come about? And how did you guys design this thing? And I'm like, well, honestly, you know, it, it's just over the years has been carved and tweaked and polished and added to, and you know, we're always trying to reinvent it and make it better. But it was really, it really started by, I remember seeing you guys, I think it was at the old, what, what it's now the House of Blues on Lansdowne Street in Boston. You guys yeah. were doing a show there. I don't remember what the name of the place was, but um, do you, Maybe by the way? Like Mom, Mama Ken or something? No, nope, it wasn't Mama Ken's. It's where, it's where it was, I, don't, I can't remember the name of it. I don't know if it was Avalon or something like that, but. Probably it was, Avalon. Yeah, Avalon. it was one of those places and it had a decent sized stage and. I remember seeing you guys doing it and I just thought it was so cool. And I started thinking, why am I not doing something like that? I'm a drummer and I got a yeah. great drummer with me. And why are we not like doing something really elaborate? And that's, that's how the whole thing was birthed through that little jam yeah. you guys did. Hey man, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bit of a frustrated drummer. It's one of my favorite things to do. Listen, I love playing guitar, but getting on a kit is, is gotta be the most fun thing to do for any musician. If you can play. You know, yeah. it's, just, it's just physical and, and, and you, you keep the groove in the pocket and you get to just have so much fun. It's, it's, it's such an expressive physical instrument. You know? Well, everything's so. rhythmic, too. I mean, when you think about it, it had to have been the first instrument created. Somebody at some point stomped their feet and clapped their Something hands. And that down. was, <laughs> yeah, it's primitive, right? I mean, it definitely came around before guitar or anything else, piano, whatever. So, you know, and it affects and it affects. I tell people all the time, you know, when 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 we first started or after like the first couple of guitar magazines, people you'd get you do a clinic or something goes like, what do you got for advice? The first thing I'd say was like, learn how to play drums. And they looked at me like, I thought you were going to show me like some scales or something. I'm like, no drums. It's rhythmic. The way I play is basically all percussive because I play drums. The way you have a pocket when you play with your band, writing yes. everything, man, drums are the center of it all. So it's, totally. good, it's good to know. I, and then I, then I realized when I met Eddie that he played, he was a drummer first, like almost all the guitar players that I know that I love were all can sit behind a kit. Class. You know, and I, I wanted to ask you about that too, because again, over the years, we've just become really good friends and we don't really get into these conversations about music sometimes, but because it's the, always the thread of this specific show, yeah. I always wanted to ask you too, like, is Eddie your main influence? Like, was he your main inspiration as you got into guitar? Because you have a lot of similarities and I mean, of course, I yeah. think anybody who knows you knows you're a monster player. And you, I mean, you're really amazing, yeah. but there's a lot of similarities. And I, I tell people all the time, I'm like, 
if Eddie Van Halen didn't exist, I really believe you would be the dude that like people would think is the Eddie Van Halen of that time. And so, and well, I this, wonder this if the, good, the, the yeah, style good reason for that. If Eddie, Van, if Eddie Van Halen exists, Nuno wouldn't exist. That's <laughs> so why. he was your guy. Yeah, look. I, like I Neil think Pert we, was my guy. I was just curious. Was he your guy well, from the beginning or was this say, someone I first say, before him? Yeah, I have to say there's like, there's a moment of, you know, we have these we have these sit downs sometimes out here at the, uh, the at the old Rainbow. Once in a while, get together with Morell and a couple of guys, and they always say, "What is your Mount Rushmore for you? Yeah. you know, what is your Mount Rushmore guitar players?" And when we talk about that, we talk about not just the ones we know. There's many going to be left off, but what are the ones that fucked you up? Yeah, to the point that's like stop everything, get in your bedroom for eight to eighteen hours a day and study it and learn it and and just want to be able to do it and. Yeah. Obviously, and there's there's that, and then there's the guy who made you just want to play drums. So in the beginning for me, I think, I mean, play guitar. So in the beginning for me, I think it's like, I look at like, I used to just stare at Aerosmith Records, you know, I used to just stare at Joe Perry because that was just turning you on to rock and roll. Like, I want to do that. I want to be able to play rock and roll. And of course, you know, and then there was Zeppelin, and then it was like fucking Page, but it was all of Zeppelin. You know what I mean? It was the whole package. Same thing with Aerosmith. Those were the bands that first were like, Obviously, Beatles, Zeppelin, Aerosmith, in a nutshell, some of the greatest that go like, I want to do this. But then comes along, you know, and as you're sitting there learning the ocean and going, bum, bum, ba, da, da, and you're like, okay, that was hard enough in the beginning. But then you fucking put on eruption for the first time in 1970. <laughs> you're like, the fucking aliens just land and like, <laughs> just destroy every guitar. We didn't know what it was. It wasn't even like, what is he doing? What's going on? The rhythm. And it's not just, it's not just eruption. It's the rhythm sound. The tone, the fucking echo, the delay, everything that was happening, it just, it made you go back to the drawing board of like, what just happened? It's like yeah. an asteroid just fucking landed and rocked the planet. Who, did, have you ever heard of like, who's, who, who's Eddie's guy? Like, who's his guy growing up? How did he you get know, there? I, you, know, you know, it's interesting when, when, when uh, sometimes I sit with guitarists and I think I was having this conversation with Zach Wilde not too long ago. And he, Zach, Zach refers to it to everybody has their own soup. You know what I mean? It's like, nobody's like kind of, it's just what, hmm, I can taste, I can taste a little Eddie in there. I can taste like for me, he goes, he goes, when you, you know, I taste some Eddie. I taste a little Alda Miola because you're percussive, which is right. Yes. Like I was really obsessed with Alda Miola. So that's where a lot of the percussion and muting and stuff comes from. Yes. And stuff is that. So he goes, I, he, and he, he had me down pat. He's like, I could taste a few little real strong ingredients in there. And then I think when you talk about Eddie, I used to ask him, I go, I asked him the same thing. What do you think about it? He's like, you know, Everything that you hear from Van Halen, everybody's like, it swings. It's like, gun, 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 gun. And no other rock band was doing it except for like ZZ Top. They used to do a lot of that stuff. And they did a lot of ZZ Top. And they did a lot of that old classic kind of rock and roll. So I th for me, Eddie, it's like I, I definitely hear a lot of that rhythm side, Billy Gibbons kind of stuff and, uh, and blues swing kind of stuff that was happening. But I, I can't say that I know exactly that guy influenced Eddie more than somebody else because Eddie was so distinctly him. Now I know yeah. they played covers and when we play covers, that's where we learn everything. That's our university. We, sometimes we don't know, we, you know, you are what you eat and we don't know exactly what that is. Like I might be obsessed with somebody, but then you're going to hear other things and go like, where the fuck did that come from? And it could yeah. be just, I grew up on Genesis. I grew up on, you know, when you talk about the jam that, that you saw us do for me, I remember watching Phil Collins on stage doing like three, Chester you know, Thompson, right? Yeah, Chester Thompson. And they were doing the trading stuff, and mm -hmm. that's where I got it from. Yep. And I was like, that is badass. That's yeah. cool. And so, and sometimes people go, Genesis, really? I'm like, it's all in there. It's all, you know, we, we have probably 100 to 200, like a jukebox in our head that we might just pull on a song and you might hear it. You know, yeah. we did three sides to every story, but it's like, holy shit, man, you're doing like some progressive credit. And I go, that's my have my those roots are in there kansas and genesis and all the prog stuff that i listen to you know yeah so it's funny that you bring up the muted stuff too because i really have identified that with you over the years like to me that's one of your signature things is having that yeah. that was the, yeah. i just i love that and it's because i'm a drummer you know it's like i'm super yeah. percussive myself and like i love that um and, but I was going to say too, do you think as, as being, you know, the guitar player that you are at your level, is the swing kind of tempos the most favorable kind of tempos to like solo to, do you think? Is it part not of that you me. think? No. Not for me. Because really with, I, I, did we have, we, I think we did like one or two in our history of like actually, you know, proper swing rock stuff. For me, it's always been more of that kind of pocket the funkier yes. kind of straight four on the floor funk kind of pocket that we always did 
uh, you know, with stuff that was like, it's the monster, Cupid's dead or things like that. That was my pocket to solo on. And I always felt really good there. The swing stuff is like, when you bring that up, man, that is, that to me is, is harder because it's patient. Like, you know, it's like when you hear like, so this is love by the hand. The solo is not crazy because there isn't a lot of craziness you can do unless it's like hop a teacher and they fucking speed it up beyond belief, you know, yeah, right. so fast. Then Eddie I think we jammed that one night at Key, Key Club <laughs> in Sunset with uh, <laughs> we did. Uh, we Steel did. Panther. Did, did, we do, we did, did we do it at your birthday, at your 50th? Oh, my God. I almost forgot we about did. that. We did. That's right. Yeah. Um, so what? tell me when, because I, I, I swear to you, these are some of the things I don't even know because I never thought to ask you, Apollo, whatever, but when did Extreme actually, when were you guys actually born? When was the band actually born? It's got to be eighty. Four, 85, 85, 85. Wow. Right around that time too, you had done something with Janet Jackson, right? You, you were, did, were you, yeah, did we, you write, co-write that with her? Or was it just the solo yeah, you no, played we on it? She was a label mate. She was on A&M. We were oh, on A&M. Oh, right on. We were, here, we were out here recording porn graffiti in the Valley in LA. And, um, and I get a call from the A&R guy. He goes, look, she's, she's done some other stuff. Vernon Reed tried playing on it, doing all this stuff. I think he did his own version. So they had like three or four. And she really, you know, digs your stuff and your vibe because we were kind of like a funkier band. And, and so we interrupted the porn graffiti session for a night and set up the studio. And, and, and uh, Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis, who I love as producers, were coming in, bringing the master in. And they said, it's Black Cat and they're going to do it great. I'm sitting there waiting. They come in or ex- and then comes in Janet. I'm like, fuck. Yes. Like, and you were like, like yes. Up. Yes, and uh, and you know how it is in the studio in the control room. It's like you're standing playing, and and by the way, during those years, Black Hat, those years, Janet just stupid. She had just been on the out. She had just been show. on the cover of Rolling Stone with that with her mm. somebody holding her breasts out, like doing the smoke show. Thing. Yeah, so did that, and uh, and ended up being on the single. Ended up being, I just you know rocked it out, and it was kind of cool. It was the first before porn, porn graffiti broke it was a number one single that i was part of i was like this is crazy it was yeah that was i i like the song too man if you guys haven't heard it yet check out black cat by janet jackson because the new note did rock, you co-write it it's you co-write it man. well just no i didn't song. co-write it. just, just so played the guitar yeah cool yeah on the whole song though yeah 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 um so i want to get into some some nitty-gritty stuff here because again all these years later just from getting to know you guys over the years, becoming friends or whatever. So I'm going to tell you a quick story that <laughs> you're going to remember. So I don't even remember what year it was. It had to have been early, I'm going to say early to mid 2000s. Mm-hmm. We were, Godsmack had come through. We were on some kind of break or we were recording something in LA and we were staying at the Wyndham Hotel across from the Whiskey. And you were doing a project with Perry Farrell from Jane's Addiction. And we all went to the Key Club, I think, to go yeah. see Steel Panther or something that night. You know where I'm going with this, right? Yeah. We, opened, we opened for Steel Panther, didn't we? <laughs> Who did? Didn't, didn't, didn't. Oh, wait. Okay, no, no, keep going. This is a different. I, I don't know if, who opened for who. I just know that we were coming back and we were wasty face. And I had pulled up to the hotel with Paul and he let me out. And I was, and then you had pulled in behind us and you had a new song cranking that you had done with Perry and you're like, dude, come here, you got to check out the song. So I, I stuck my head in the passenger's window and I was kind of jamming out and listening to this track. And then I felt someone grab me by the back of the shirt and pull me out of the car. And I looked behind me and there's this big giant black guy with a suit on an earpiece and he was like security for the hotel remember do you remember this oh my god and he then like, and god. then i was like dude what are you doing and he's and he was just like oh you pill popping punks and he started like flipping out on me you gotta turn that shit down i go this is i wasn't even first of all i wasn't even cranking the music he was fucking cranking the music <laughs> and second of all fucking stop grabbing and he kept pushing and pushing yeah. And then I, sm- <laughs> I punched the guy in the face. I did. Yeah. He pushed. I reacted. I hit him in the face. He went down. It was like a whole scene. And all I remember was Paul running around the side of the car. You got out of the car. Paul got out of the car. Yeah. And I remember Paul going like, you just assaulted my client. And the guy was on the floor. And I was like, I don't even remember I what happened. I remember- about that. You just made me relive the whole thing. Holy well, shit. It's not, that's not even the reason why I'm saying this because hold on, let me put on my fucking stupid glass. That was the night, that was the night I said, I'll never fuck with Sully again. Ever with <laughs> that guy, like, 
I don't know what his deal was, but I know he got fired the next day. And, and from what they said at the hotel, he was really yeah, like. Yeah, because he didn't even talk to like you were a guest. He was he, like fucking just like. He what? was pushing and grabbing and shoving and whatever. So for those of you who don't know, Paul Geary is my manager. I explained this a little bit earlier, but he's my manager, has been Godsmack's manager for the longest time. And Paul was Nuno's drummer um, all through the years of Extreme. And you guys did three records together, whatever. Um, we, actually did, we actually did four, but he, uh, uh, it was during the fourth that he, he, he played on everything on the fourth album except for a couple of tracks. Oh, well, Punchline, yeah. well, Paul, let me just put on my back in a little shades. In here. <laughs> okay, yeah, because Paul, and shut up, don't say anything about my fucking glasses. It's just that time now. Hey, look what I'm wearing. I started with <laughs> it. was a way bigger. <laughs> so Paul was so kind to send me a couple of stories that, you know, he thought maybe we should bring up oh, and talk about. Prick. What a prick of being sabotaged. <laughs> For all the years you guys yeah, spent. You know, <laughs> were you, were you like, when you were growing up, were you like, um, you know, cause you're spunky like me too. So were you, were you a fighter growing up? Oh yeah, dude. I was fighting people I shouldn't be fighting. I was yeah. like football players in high school that were fucking with other Portuguese <laughs> kids that just moved there and they couldn't speak the language. And they're like, you know, I would, I'd see him put him up against one. Like they say like shit, like speak the language. And I'd walk by and I'm like, yeah, you're right. We should all speak the native fucking Apache Yeah, you got to stick your you two cents it? in there. <laughs> and there it is. Yeah. Always fighting people you shouldn't fight. Um, so first of all, Paul, Paul says that you are the one that's just always late in the band. Always late. He said everything was, I that, hey, I everything that, that you missed or were late for was because they were always waiting on you to come down. So is that true Without or not? Doubt. Without a doubt. Yeah, the late you know guy. why that was? Because I was the one up in the fucking room writing all this shit for the next or fucking Or sleeping album. till two o'clock in the afternoon well, when the bus calls all at till noon. Until 10 a.m. So. <laughs> uh, um, okay, here's a story that you could probably tell. Do you care to tell us the Sebastian Bach story when you guys were flying back from Russia on the plane and the pilot what? came out to take away Sebastian's Jack Daniels. By the way, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get him on this fucking show because he's one of my best friends, and that dude makes me laugh more than anybody. Oh, yeah, dude, I love Sebastian. So and you, know what? you tell it, or he's going to tell it, but I'm going to have well, both of you tell it. We probably have two different versions because one of us <laughs> is a lot more and I'm not going to point any fingers at Sebastian. But, but, right. So wait, let me, let me tee it up for you. So, so – you guys are coming back from Russia, right? No, we were coming back from we were coming back from Rio from from uh, from doing a big 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 stadium festival to to like it was called Hollywood Rock Fest. It was and us who, and who was Skid on the plane Road. with you? So we're coming back, and what happened is when we got there, when we got to this is when we went to, to to Brazil for the first time. We had no idea what to happen. We walked out of that airport, and it was like Beatlemania type shit. I lost like a chunk of my hair. My luggage went flying. We, <laughs> we didn't know what to expect. It was insanity. Like. Security guards grabbing me, just throwing me on a bus. The bus is being rocked and stuff. We're like, what is happening here in Brazil? People, and I, and then had a lot to do with the fact I spoke Portuguese as well. So it was kind of like a bit of a oh, homecoming yeah. in, in a crazy way. Greatest fucking fans too in the world, like passionate and just, you know. Um, so we go to our hotels. We get all these briefings that are like, you can't leave the hotel. It's too dangerous. Can't do this. People are taking stuff, stealing things. People are a lot of poor, a lot of stuff. And, you know, we're like, but these are beautiful people. You know, we, we all wanted to go out. And Sebastian would just, but, you know, say, fuck what they're telling us. Let's go. Let's go hang gliding. You know, shit like that. And, uh, and, and I'm, I believe it was a hang gliding accident where Sebastian landed. And I think he broke his foot. Shut up. This is be- In Brazil? We- yeah. I think we. In South America? Yeah. So this is before we did any shows. <laughs> so, so, uh, so then he comes in and I like, are they still doing the shows? He's like, yeah, they bring him up on a wheelchair. And then he's like, fuck, fuck the wheelchair. He's got the cane. And now he's, you know, youth gone wild and he's got, he's limping and he's got his cast and he's on, he's taking painkillers and he's drinking every, everything's just, it's a rock show. That's all good. Two great shows. Seal was on it. Like Jesus Jones, like crazy lineup, like of all these different bands. Right. Okay, cool. Coming back. It ends up going to Miami. It's the, as, as, as David Lee Roth referred to us as, it's the extremes. It's the extremes and the Skid Rose. He, he pluralized every band I've ever, ever so, spoken So about. all of extreme and all of Skid Row is on the same plane. Is yeah, there any, any other bands on the plane? It was, no, this, this happens to be like, do you remember the, when the planes were a little older back then? You'd go up, there'd be like a business class, but it'd be a small area up top only. The, the tube was only like would fit just enough for the, for the Skid Row dudes on one side with, with I think Scott McGee and then us and 
and, and remember the back was like the wall, the cockpit's there, the back's the wall behind you, it's carpeted. You have to go down the stairs in the side and the front. So we're like, oh, this is cool. We've been hanging this whole trip. We're just gonna get on the plane. We're all exhausted, right? Wrong. We get on and we're, I'm, I'm, we get on the plane and, and I remember, I, I remember we, I'm just sitting there and Sebastian, you know, he wanted a drink. So the, the stewardess is bringing by the cart, gives him, it was wine, I think. It was just wine and some whiskey, a little mix of everything. Cool. Comes back around again. We're a couple hours in, three hours in. He wants something else. Great. No problem. After the third one, she says to him, I, I can't serve you anymore. And I was just like, and I was hearing the conversation. Everybody's starting to pass out, but I'm like, I'm a late everything, late sleeper. I, I work when I'm traveling, whatever. So I get the light on, whatever. And I'm hearing this like from across the fucking aisle. And I'm like, to a row behind me, but the other side. He's like, I want to drink now. And he's like, no, you cannot. We can't serve you anymore. Like he's had a lot to drink. So lights go down. She goes back downstairs. Sebastian gets up and he goes to the liquor cabinet down there and he grabs a bottle. <laughs> and so she comes back He grabs back a up. bottle of what? What is it? He grabs a bottle. I can't remember what it was. It was either wine because it might have been a bottle, a, a bottle of wine. And she's like, she, she comes by again and she sees that he's drinking. So she's like, I have to take that from you. You cannot, that's like a, you cannot go in and break into the the liquor and start taking our bottles. So he's like, he's, he's, he's kind of half fighting with, he's like, come on, don't be such a, you know, whatever. So she takes the bottle, he takes his last drink, and he's now getting kind of riled up with her because she's not letting him drink. So then I, he was getting a little bit antsy and a little bit like a little youth gone wildish, if you know what I'm saying. He's like he's getting loud. He's like, what the fuck? And I'm like, this is going to be amped up. So I remember a fan. I'm like, okay, I know how to, uh, you know, I know how to, I know how to get him to, uh, to relax. And a fan gave me a bottle of wine from down there. It's a gift at the airport. And I put it in my bag and it's in my car. And I'm like, cool. So to get him to chill and I'll have one with him, like, hey, 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 Baz, here's, here's, here's a bottle, here's a drink, whatever. So, so this is what I'm hearing. He's sitting there back so there. You're the culprit. Me, you gave him the drink. Check this out. I, it, it was about to go bad. Trust me. I was kind of just trying to chill him out. And I was just like, Let, let's do it. And he was getting kind of angry because they wouldn't, they would, he was, he was arguing with the stewardess like badly. So I was like, I got to calm him down. And then, so then I thought it was under control because all I could hear while I closed my eyes, I could hear Sebastian really quiet. He had this little voice that he put on and he's like, and he kept singing over and over. Like a ship without a sail. And then he'd pause and then he'd go. Like a door without a knob. And then he like, the like fuck? Your foot without a shoe. And I'm like, he's losing his mind. He's, that's all I can hear. Like a little mouse singing back there from the loudest rock and roll singer. So then all of a sudden, everything seems great. I'm about to pass out. All the lights come on on the plane. The woman came by the stewardess, saw my bottle, thought he went back down again. That was a wrap. Lights come on. Cockpit door opens. Captain comes out. <laughs> Not like the co-pilot or the third guy that's asleep up there. The captain. He comes over and I'm watching this. Scott McGee wakes up. Everybody's like, what the hell's going on? And he's like, look, this is a federal offense. And he's like speaking with a broken Portuguese accent because it was like a Brazilian airline, whatever. It's like, you cannot do that again. If you do that again, you will be arrested. And this guy's going off. And I'm going to do this because and I'm going to cut off my head because it's, this is what it's going to look like to the captain. Because, you know, Sebastian's like 6'4", so shit, right? <laughs> so this guy's just like, he's tearing into Sebastian. And Sebastian just watch him. Sebastian goes, are you talking to me? And he stands up and this guy's head is like here. <laughs> and he's looking down at the captain and we're like, oh, no. And he's like, are you talking to me? Like in, in fucking taxi driving fashion. He grabs the shirt of the captain of the plane and throws him into the back carpeted wall of the plane. <sighs> Boom. We all jump up like, what the fuck? And what I didn't forgot to tell you is it was extreme and skid row, except for an elderly couple that's gotta be in their 60s or oh 70s. Oh my God. That the guy, I was hearing in Portuguese while the captain was thrown, I hear the wife go, oh my God. And she's screaming because they're coming back from a heart surgery in oh. Brazil. <laughs> this guy just did and he's holding his chest, right? <laughs> So now the captain is shaking. He's up against the wall. Sebastian's going towards him. And me, the extreme dudes, jump, Paul, everybody. We tackle Sebastian down to the and ground. And you're 36,000 feet in the air, oh, yeah. flying over feet. some ocean. Yeah. And he's fucking, and he's assaulting the captain who needs to fly the plane Holy to get us home, shit. by the way. Holy shit. And this is pre-9-11. 9-11, forget about it. Oh, you know yeah. what I mean? So, so all of a sudden, we're like, we got him down. And I remember while we're all on top, I'm going, Sebastian, you got to stop, man. This is fucking crazy. You, 
you can't do this. He's the captain of the plane. And Smash's like, fuck this dude, whatever it is. And I'm looking up. And as I'm looking up, I see Snake, good friend of mine, fucking his hands folded. He's reading a magazine. <laughs> That's his guitar player. Yeah. So I'm yeah. looking up. It was the whole band. So I look up and I go, you guys want to do this? Snake goes, what, this? Again? Like, <laughs> it's just daily routine with Sebastian. <laughs> so what and, happens? Uh, so the plane lands and... So, and look, the, so what happened was, and, I knew that when the plane landed, you know, no offense, Sebastian, I love you, bro, but I got up. You're that like ducking out like this. I, I got up dude. because I didn't want to be like, I was like, I don't want to go straight to, all I saw, I think, was Sebastian was being like, wheeled away in a, with the authorities in a wheelchair. So I don't know what happened to him after, but definitely that was some dangerous shit. And I don't know if they pressed charges or whatever happened, but oh, that's so, what I remember. I have to say we were all drinking a lot and doing I got to tell you, I was, I, was, I was talking to Paul about it too because he was telling me the story one day and he actually had a little bit more information too. He said there was a point where when the captain came over and he was like, you can't, and he took the bottle and, and they were doing this for a minute. No, me, yeah, oh, yeah, uh, yeah. and then boom, he yeah. hit him and the guy yeah. went down. I'm like, yeah. oh my God. Yeah, it was, it was, it was insane. And, and you know, I, this, this, this little part of the story, and maybe you can ask Paul or you can maybe, because Scott McGee, I never asked him, but I remember being on the side of the stage and Scott McGee, we know, we know a manager is a manager, but like you don't need to carry a brave, briefcase to let us know you're a manager, right? But I remember him having a briefcase watching the band. I'm like, that's a little bit like, you know, pretentious or whatever, thinking of my fucking 23 year old self, you know? So if I remember correctly, and maybe I made this up in my head, but all of a sudden the, the same briefcase that I was making fun of opened up and it was like a sawed off uh, baseball bat that was, he used to carry around, not for the fans, but I think to take care of business with, with Sebastian. With band, with Sebastian. Yeah. I don't know. You need to ask Sebastian if this is true because I remember this happening, but I don't know if I'm. If I'm I want to ask him about this, but I, I went out with him one time and, and I think we started to bring it up, but he, I don't think he remembers any of it because he was just out of He's his mind. Remember because he was taking painkillers as long as with the alcohol for his, for his, for his leg. I love that dude, man. I got to tell you, I've, I've never laughed harder than when I hung out with that dude. We were actually doing a show once and his solo band was playing and, and then it was Twisted Sister and then it was Godsmack and we were at some fucking town fair in the middle of a field somewhere or whatever. It was like one of those weird, like it looked like bingo hall seats and shit. And I'm like, it was just the weirdest lineup. But so Sebastian gets done and then Twisted Sister's on and I'm in the dressing room and I'm starting to get ready and I'm like, I told Shannon, I go, I got to go see a little bit of this because I've never got to see him. And I just, you know, it's all these years later and they're older and I just want to see. So I, I went to the stage and I'm on the side of the stage and Sebastian's standing right in front of me and he has a glass of wine in this hand. He has a joint in the other hand. And I remember he came towards me and, you know, there's Twisted Sister with their leathers on and the bass player's like got a big old belly now and he couldn't button his vest and all that. <laughs> And so I, I leaned over at one point. I'm like, wow, the bass player looks like he took good care of himself over the years. And Sebastian turns around and he goes, dude, the bass player looks like he ate the band Twisted Sister. <laughs> I was on the floor dying. I'm like, this oh. fucking guy doesn't care. And then there's another time we're in a club and we did this kind of celebrity jam thing or whatever. And we, they set us up. We were in D.C. So there's all these like Secret Service guys with earpieces and shit. And we went into the bar section of the hotel and we're, we're in this like a little roped off area for us. And Sebastian comes in and he's, you know him, he's always playing with his fucking hair and stuff. And, um, <laughs> and in the middle of this really nice kind of club, he's smoking a joint and one of the dudes in the black suits from like five people away, you know, he's looking over his head and he goes, hey, hey, you can't fucking what are you doing and sebastian looks over he's like what and he goes you can't smoke in here and he goes i'm not and he <laughs> takes this huge hit and flicks it away in the middle of this club hey man so before we go too i want to ask you a couple of things but tell us about um you had contacted me early in the year when we were tour well er, last year i should say um we were still in the middle of a tour but you were telling me about this really awesome concert that you are you're going to be, how do I say it? Hosting, promoting, yeah, yeah, orchestrating yeah. It, like something. Yeah. But I, I do want to tell the people a little bit about, I, I'm going to let you take it from here. But so Nuno has this idea and, and it was ready to go. Everything was kind of like dialed in and they were ready to launch it. It was called Concert for Earth. 
and it was, I believe, in the Azores of Portugal. Yeah, is that right? Azores in Portugal is where I was born. Yeah. So tell 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 everybody about it because it's not dead in the water. It's just that no, kind of COVID screwed up this we're, thing too. So it's kind of on pause for a minute, and we're gonna fast forward it to. Life is on pause, right? Life is All on our pause. careers are on pause. So, for- so tell us a little bit about this first, because I really think a lot of people are going to be interested in this, and it's a pretty epic, awesome festival that I think you guys are going to do, and I'm going to be super excited to be a part of it, but tell, tell them what it's yeah, about. Look, I mean, look, uh, it's one of those things, the, the most important part is, is this, to be, to be immersive, to not, the last thing anybody wants is a bunch of fucking artists telling you to save the planet. Go well, fuck it's, yourself. It's awareness, isn't it? I mean, isn't this it's really what it's about? It's about bringing awareness to the planet. We're, we're, we're sitting around to let, let politicians and let Trump and let everybody else think they're going to do this for us. It's not. It's in our fucking hands. If we want our kids to have air to breathe, we got to get up off our asses and see what can we do. What are we doing? Is it our diets a little bit? I'm not asking anybody if you want to listen. If I love animals, I'm not telling anybody what they should or shouldn't do, right? What I'm saying is it's balance. We, me and you talked about balance. It's about balance. We are out of balance right now. So the concert is to talk to people, to reach people, not to go to tell them to save the planet, the artists save the planet while they're going to their third house in the Hollywood Hills, because nobody's going to listen. It's the artists to stand up there and go, I'm fucking up too. I'm doing shit that I should be doing. I might be driving the wrong car. Maybe I can help. Maybe, maybe I can have meatless fucking Mondays. I don't know, but what can I do? <laughs> what can I learn? What can I do to help and do my part? Because it's going to take the plan to do it. I thought it might not be possible, but look what the fuck we just did. We just stopped. We did the hardest thing in the world to do, yeah. which is get billions of people to freeze. Yeah, pause. That's pretty powerful. The world was rotating and then it went pause. No. If Three we months. can do that, Sully, if we can come together and do that to stop all of us from dying, then at least we can at least go like, all right, Make let's just take effort. a look at this. Yeah. Let's take a look at this together. I'm not asking you that you have to go to move to fucking Africa and do some crazy shit. What I'm saying is the artist, the concert is for us to get together, for you, me, as many artists as we want to, to get together, engage with them. Not just for that day. Fuck, Earth Day is great, but I'm not into like Earth Day. Turn my bulb off for one hour. Great, yeah, but, I did my but year round. Do something to make a difference to year help round, change we'll a little bit. A bunch of stuff. We'll do it together. Do it and, together. And by the way, it's not just for the artists, right? You guys are hosting this in a location where they can actually see, smell, and touch and feel the beauty, right? Because from what I understand it's and from the pictures that I've seen, this is being performed in, isn't it? In like the in the crater it's of in a, a volcano, volcano crater. That's amazing in itself. Volcano crater with his lakes now. It's in the Azores. It's my. It's it's my. It's the motherland. It's not my home because I live here. I'm not pretentious fuck that call it my home. I was born there, but I moved when I was young. But it's my motherland. I have a huge connection with it. I still love it. I feel when I go there. I feel like it is my home in many ways, in in a different way, and 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 I embrace it. And I wanted it to be the center. And it is the center. It's the center of the Atlantic. It's the center of the universe as far as I'm concerned. It's old maps would say that it was like Atlantis in a way. That's why we're calling it the Atlantis concert for Earth. It's beautiful. And, using the, and it is beautiful. And it's, but let me tell you, we're, we're bringing in, we're not doing it. It's not going to be a bunch of us dumbass musicians telling people to save the planet. We're bringing the troops. We're bringing the people for everybody to tune in and go like, this is how you can do it. There are people out there, like for instance, everybody just gets in an argument and they go vote for this guy because it's climate change and then everybody gets into a fucking fight. Forget all that. What we're yeah. doing is bringing people in that can teach us. They already have solutions that are doing it that can make money, that can, that can bring jobs, that can do things with trash and do stuff. There, there, there's an entrepreneur who's like 18 years old and he's got, he's got two or three machines that he built that are in the Atlantic Pacific that are picking up all the plastic and doing stuff. But why isn't he known? Why is he known on the right. fucking cover of time? Yeah. So what we want to do is have a place for everybody to go who's sick of hearing about sea levels, who's sick of hearing about science that we don't get. And this is going to be Earth for Dummies. It's going to be fucking Earth for Dummies that really because the people, the guy on 4 or 5 who's going like, yeah, that's great fucking Leonardo DiCaprio. You can save the planet <laughs> because I'm trying to pay my rent. I got fucking, I mean, I'm in traffic all day and you're good. We got to talk to them and say, while you're, while you're doing that, there is something you can do. You know yeah. why? Because it's got to be by the numbers. Yeah. Right on. Yeah. So follow Nuno on his Instagram. It's uh, at Nuno Benton Court official on yeah. Instagram or whatever. All right. So listen, I'm going to cut you loose in a second. But before you go, I want to have a little fun here. All right. I'm going to play a game called Don't Fucking Bullshit Me because I've been there too. 
That's the name of the game. I just I made that. it up. I love that. That, <laughs> should, the first, that, should get a, that should get a Grammy. You're the first one to play it. It's called Don't oh, Bullshit great. Me. <laughs> There's only yeah. five questions because I can only think of five for now. So maybe this All will right. grow as it goes along, but I'm going to cut you loose. I'll have, so. Brady then. I'll have the, the trader answer the question. These are easy. It's just about how honest you're going to be. That's all. Because I'm super right. fucking honest. I don't care. I'll answer all this shit all day long. I don't care. Okay. People are always like, oh, you're going to say that? As long gonna, as I don't mind, I don't mind, myself. I don't gonna, mind hurting myself. I just don't like hurting other people if I, if I can avoid it. But here we go. Let's try this. Well, let's see. <laughs> okay. First question. Don't bullshit me. What's the city that creeps you out the most when you tour through there? <laughs> this is always one. I'll tell you right now what mine is. New Orleans. It fucking just creeps me out. Because I, it's the whole not the people. Thing. It's just, it's thing. got a yeah. vibe that just fucking, and Milwaukee. Milwaukee has just got some weird ass shit going on there. So for me, those are my creepy cities. I think, I there's think, gotta be something that creep. When you go there, there you go, I fucking hate one. coming you, here. You know what's interesting? I, there is one. And, and like you said, it's not the people. And, and I, they, and it has a sister that does the same th- city, same thing to me. Growing up, it felt like that. Touring plane, they felt like that. Fucking Worcester, Massachusetts. Really? I swear to God. Massachusetts. Worcester. And I love, I have family in Worcester. I used to spend rehearsing in Worcester. But back in the day, it reminded me of when I went, when we had to play in Buffalo. There was something about Buffalo that just, just brought me so down. Even though I know the people are passionate, great football fans, the food, the fucking weight, all that shit. But there was something about a feeling that I used to be like, Okay, this is kind of weird to me, and it, it's creepy to me. And maybe it's because it's so, so industrial and it's so it's cold as fuck. And it's like, but Wish used to be this like factories, the highway that went through it was just what was it, fucking uh, what route is it, 290, whatever it is. Like you go through, and it was just the houses, everything about it that I was just like, something just doesn't you out. with me. It felt like it was trapped in time. It was a, it was a generation before me. I think what set me off from Milwaukee is the first time I went through there, I was touring with a band called strip mine. It was back in 93 and yeah. it was right after that whole Dama thing went down and we were staying at the hotel, which was right on the same block as the fucking apartment buildings that he was in. And ever since then I was just skeeved out about Milwaukee. So whenever I go there, I just think about weird shit and I just yeah, hate yeah. it. Um, okay, so what's the, uh, this is a two-parter, but I'm going to give you the, the first part's easy. What's the sickest you've ever been on tour and played through the show? How sick were you? Were like, oh my god. I mean, that's one thing I'll say about musicians, man. You know, the singer probably has a worse job because it affects his instrument, but a guitar player. I've learned I mean, that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I learned that when I first did my first solo album, Schizophonic, and I had the tour. I called Gary. I went, sorry, man. <laughs> sorry, I bitched you off for so many times. Yeah. Your voice was you're going to bed early, drinking your tea, yeah. doing whatever it is you're doing. I remember no. being a drummer and going like, I hated when I had the flu or something like that. Cause I'm like, you guys don't understand. It's fucking physical, man. I'm like doing aerobics back here on the drums and I can't do it when I'm sick. And then I became a singer and I went, oh. I'll be a drummer any day with the yeah. flu. Cause a you drum mean, still sounds like a drum. Yeah. I remember being so sick. I, 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 I'm trying to remember what show it was or what city, but I remember being so sick, like, you know, fucking, God forbid. Like flu not sick like, or puking not, not sick? Not like a pussy saying I got the flu because of COVID, but anyways, like well, I'm talking you puking or shit in I'm your ass. Body, vomiting out of both centers Piss of the it universe. out of your ass. It's all going down and everybody looking at me going, you're canceling. I'm like, hell no. You don't cancel shows. Like I'm going, I couldn't stand. I couldn't stand. I, I was just like standing. I'd be, I thought I was going to pass off, but I'm like, just get me up there right before the show because I know the one thing that happens to all of us. Adrenaline. The yeah. greatest drug of all time. You could be dying. You could have a fucking 110 fever. For some reason, when that show starts and you kick into that, your motor fucking skills, everything jumps in and you play that show like it's like, like you never did before. But the second it's over, yeah. you will pay. Right back. The- <laughs> will well, that's decades. funny because the next part of the question was, how many times did you fake being sick and cancel? <laughs> <laughs> Funny. That's a funny question. Uh, I have to say, I've never done that. You never faked being say, sick to cancel a show? to cancel a show Because you didn't ever, feel ever. good or something? And, and I have to say, like, all the, way up until, have to say all, the way up until, all the way up until Punchline, which is our fourth album, Extreme had never canceled one show until Gary literally had no voice. And I think it was in Philly. He had no voice on the Punchline tour. And uh, that was the only show we ever canceled, I think. Really? How many times did you lie to your bandmates about not showing up for practice? 
how many bullshit stories did you make up when you <laughs> show up? <laughs> did you ever Man, tell the truth it, ever? You're making me sound like the fucking goody two shoes. <laughs> no, because these are the fucking questions that I know we all do. And no one ever asks us this shit because they don't know to ask us this shit. No, but I, since I, I'm that, in this so fucking those, game those with you, the, that's why it's the questions. name of the game is don't bullshit me because I've fucking been there too. Yeah, yeah. But I have to say, like, what I mean is, like, I think I, I, think I was the asshole that was like, why didn't you come? Because I was, ah. like, ready to – I was the guy that was, like, ready to take on the planet, write more songs, rehearse, get ah. better. And then there were the other dudes that were like, yeah, man, my car. Yeah, you know, I can't come into that. Yeah. Like, you know. yeah. yeah. All so right, I last was, one. You ready? Yeah. This is a big one. Don't fucking okay. lie. Don't okay. fucking lie. I won't lie. Have you ever faked an orgasm? Is that possible? <laughs> Can a guy do that? <laughs> I don't even know. Is that fucking possible? I don't know. I don't even know. But have I, you? You know, I, there's gotta been a moment where you were like in it with a girl, and you were just, and it was just wasn't happening, and then you just you're took, like, wow, I came a little bit. I don't know. Or, like, or you just like made the motions, and oh my god, you just, you know, just to get good, fucking because you're done and you're raw and you're fucking over it. Come on. Wow. You know what? I probably never. We know faked plenty them, of girls are faked in their time, but out. huh? But I probably tapped out in the middle of it because of those reasons. Just like <laughs> or all right, passed out. No, ta like tapped out, like where you're like, I'm like, oh, passed out from alcohol. It just didn't happen. But, uh, but I didn't know. I, I thought guys was the opposite. They're like, we're lucky if we make it past the fucking, past the, the five yeah, second Yeah, three dunks. <laughs> like, yeah. peace, I'm out. <laughs> that, those are good questions though, man. That, that should be a TV show. I like I'm going to, I'm going to come up with better ones and more of them because I want to ask fellow musicians shit that I know goes down behind the scenes that reporters wouldn't know to ask us. Yeah. So I thought there was a few places I, I might have to convene with you to give you to talk about a few. Cause I was a few that I was like, I hope he doesn't have this. I, hope he doesn't. <laughs> I got some of the dirt from Paul on you anyways or whatever, but yeah, oh, I wasn't sure, going to go sure. too deep on you, man. Cause this isn't about like sabotage. This was just about having a little yeah, fun. It's a family show, but I, yeah, it's become that. Um, all right, man. Well, listen, stay healthy, stay safe. And too, uh, hey, we'll see you when this thing's me, uh, done. Uh, and uh, man, just like I'll see you somewhere out there. I'll, it's still, I still. See I'm coming. I'll there, be man. your neighbor soon. Don't worry about that. I'm coming. Brother. All right, brother. We'll talk Go soon. Go Pats. Man. Peace out. See you next time, man.